From Microbe TV, this is Immune, episode number 13, recorded on October 18th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Welcome back. We made it a year. Yay. Is it a year? It is. Yeah. Happy, had, happy anniversary. <laughs> yeah. Happy anniversary. I, on, my, on my Facebook, it came up today, a picture of me with the headphones on after we had recorded the first time. Wonderful. I think it was exactly a year ago today. Neat. Also joining us from Wooster, Ohio, Steph Langle. Hey there. Great to be here. What are we in now? October? It's October. Hello. Yeah, yeah. October, yep. Um, I'm pretty happy. Yesterday submitted the dissertation to the committee. So <laughs> wonderful. Doing a little dance here. And yeah, things are going as well as they I think could be at this point. So glad to be here and talk about immunology with you guys. I think there's a, I think we have a lot of listeners that are following your saga. I here. know. That's so sweet. <laughs> so I've fun. had I know. I've had a request to live stream it through Twitter. So I think I am going to do that. So I'll let people know. And if they're interested in poor sign immunology and pregnancy, we can, I'll, I'll get, share that stream. What do you mean? You're going to, you're going to, what are you going to do in Twitter on, on, you're going to live stream your, your thesis defense? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, really? Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's, um, her name's Caitlin and I forget, I forget her last name, Van Wiley, Van Wheel. She's from MIT. She live streamed hers through Twitter and she kind of showed me how to do that. So I, I think that's what I'll do. I think it'd be so fun. You, you're going to do it yourself. So that means you're going to have to pause. They ask you a question. Then you're going to have to type it into Twitter and then answer it. Is that the idea? Well, no. I think that <laughs> the questions <laughs> part of that they're just going to have to, uh, you know, with my answers, assume what uh, you're saying that if they wanted to ask me questions. No, that- I'm just wondering how you deal with it. Because, you know, thesis defense, you give a talk, so you can't do anything during the talk. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then they're gonna they're gonna ask you questions, and if you don't pay attention to them, they're gonna get cranky. If you're gonna say, <laughs> "Give me," uh, excuse me, I have to tweet this. <laughs> I oh, know. you know what you could do though. You could have someone uh, who's a friend of yours in the audience who has the phone that can can say, "Okay, well, we have a question from Twitter." Oh, that would be. Fun. Yeah, and fine. they could ask their question, and you could answer it. How fun would that be? That would be really. But fun. the act, but you know, the actual closed defense. I don't know. How no, you, no, you don't do no, that. No, part. No. So it's just the seminar yeah. you're talking. Just about. the seminar. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, I would just set my computer up. Like at the end of the room and kind of position it, start live streaming, and then before I do the the defense with the committee, I'll. Show oh, okay, first. sure. All right. Yeah, yeah. I look forward to that. Yeah, be fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Today we have a. Uh, a it's my turn, and if it's my turn, um, there's <laughs> always viruses. there's always going to be viruses involved. Um, and this this paper is pretty cool, but it gets pretty. Mm, what's the word? Molecular. Yeah, you know, um, so cool. I always um, <clears throat> never did any immunology in my lab until the protein that's the focus of this paper was discovered, Rig I, and then I said, finally, immunology I can understand <laughs> because it's all about molecules and signaling, and uh, we we have done on and off. In fact, we just submitted a paper about sensing of the coronaviruses by Rig I and. MDA5, the other side of solic RNA sensor. So we, we on and off continue to work on it. But it was Rig I. Remember, when Rig I was discovered, retinoic acid inducible gene. And, you know, there is controversy of whether it's one or I, but everyone I calls know. it Rig I. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, why would they call it I instead of gene one? But anyway, we call it Rig I. Uh, virologists got a hold of this. It was an R- It turned out to be an RNA sensor. And they all jumped on it. Big time. It was amazing. Amazing. It's kind of backed off a little, but there's still a lot of work going on. As you can see here, this paper is all about it. So the the title, well, before I tell you the title, let me just back up a little and say, in general, whenever there is an immune response, it can't go on forever, obviously. It's got to be regulated. And that goes for innate responses all the way through adaptive responses. You can't make antibodies forever. You can't make cytotoxic T cells forever. You can't make especially interferon forever because it's pretty harmful. Yeah, high levels of interferon is associated with a lot of different autoimmune diseases and autoinflammatory diseases. Yes, and 
t- type one interferonopathy is a set of yep. diseases. If you make too much interferon, there could be lots of causes of that. Uh, and so everything has to be regulated. And maybe some of you heard of, I've heard of the SOX genes, S-O-C-S, suppressors of cytokine signaling. They're involved in regulation. Uh, but today we're going to talk about regulation of uh, innate responses, the very early responses to viral infection. And these are typically triggered when something foreign is sensed. And foreign can also be self versus non-self. But these the system exists to detect a variety of molecules, and these include proteins, nucleic acids, lipopolysaccharide, and more. And there are all sorts of sensors, and you've heard of toll-like receptors, which can sense a lot of these materials. And then there are the retinoic acid-inducible gene-1-like receptors, or RIGI-like receptors, which, which we'll talk about today. They're nucleotide oligomerization domain-like receptors, NOD-like receptors, L- NLRs. I love that one because it makes me think of sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> when I say nod, nodding, nodding, nodding off. <laughs> but we're going to. There's focus- also there's also the DNA uh, the cytosol DNA sensor. sensors, the AIM AIM two like receptors. That's AIM right, those. and C gas, yep. yeah, that whole system, Sting. and there are nuclear DNA receptors as well. So there are probably more we haven't found yet. I think. And there's safe. CLRs to C type lectin domain receptors. Right. There's lots of different. So today LRs. we're gonna today we're gonna talk about the rig eye like receptors and just one of them, rig eye itself. So the rig eye like receptors include rig eye MDA five, which means melanoma differentiation associated gene number five, which was discovered here actually at Columbia for that purpose, looking at melanoma differentiation, and it turned out to be a nucleic acid sensor. And I heard about this, and I reached out and we did a collaboration that got me into this whole MDA5 rig eye field. And then nice. what year was that? Just curious. Um, <clears throat> like 10, 15 years, right? I would say, yeah. 90s, in, maybe. In the end of the 90s, uh, beginning 2000s. Yeah. Let me see when we published our first paper. There's a <laughs> beauty of, <laughs> of having a little computer in front of me. And you know, the funny thing is I'm searching PubMed for my name. There are a couple of other rack and yellows in science, you know. Hmm. I wonder, do they have the V? I think the V helps to distinguish. No, it's actually not, not V, not V, <laughs> and certainly not V. So, our first uh, paper was was two thousand and seven. MDA five is cleaved in poliovirus infected cells. Okay. Nice. And then two thousand and nine, we found that rig eye is cleaved in picornavirus infected cells. And hmm. then we had some other papers on on interferons. And we continue to do that to this day. So the discovery of MDA5 here really got us into this. And then there's one more rig eye like receptor. It's called LGP2, which stands for Laboratory of Genetics and Physiology 2, <laughs> which is the place that discovered it. I think it was in Japan, but uh, it's another one. So rig eye is, is the one today. Rig eye. Now, what it recognizes has been a topic of much research. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you that it recognizes short, blunt-ended, double-stranded RNAs with a 5-prime triphosphate. But if you look in the literature, you can find other things that yep. will bind to rig eye as well. But for today, we'll just stick with that. And these these are typically viral. You don't often find 5-prime triphosphates in the cell, and especially in the cytoplasm. They're usually capped. And so when rig eye finds these RNAs, uh, the result is interferon is made. And the way it happens is interesting and is important for our paper. The rig eye protein, quite well studied. We know it has independent domains. It, the crystal structure has been solved. And what you should know is at the end terminus of the protein, there are two what are called card domains, which has nothing to do with playing cards, mm-hmm. but cards stand for caspase recru- and recruitment domains. And, and can you mention what a caspase is? Caspases are cellular proteases that are involved in the initiation of programmed cell death. And they need to be activated to trigger programmed cell death. All right, so there's at the end terminus, there's a card domain. And we'll talk about what that does in a moment. In the middle, there is a 
helicase, ATPase domain, a helicase which unwinds double-stranded RNA. And there are lots of helicases out there. And to unwind, they typically require energy in the form of ATP. And then at the C-terminus of the protein, there is what's called the C-terminal regulatory domain, or CTD. And this is going to be important for the paper because they're going to dissect the, the, what they find in, in these terms. And normally we think that rig eye exists in the cytosol. It's there at low levels. And the uh, car, it's folded up in a way so that the card domain is hidden. It's called an auto-inhibited state which is kind of a weird word, but that's what you'll find in the literature. But basically, the card domains are hidden. And if RNA binds to rig eye, then it opens up. The card domains are exposed. And the card domains can then bind to a mitochondrial protein called MAVs, which is in the outer membrane. And that starts the signaling, which will eventually result in the production of interferon. So it's the card domain exposure that's really important. And people know sort of how RNA binds and how it exposes it. You know, eight, actually ATP, an ATP binding pocket is formed in the helicase domain and that helps open up the protein. So it results in having this what we call open structure with the cards exposed. So if you want to remember, all you need to remember is rig eye in the cytosol is kind of folded up. When RNA binds it, the card domain opens, and that starts the signaling. That's the key. I think it's really cool that it all happens on the outer mitochondrial membrane. I just yeah, think that's that's, that that's that's the signaling nucleating place. It's, yeah, it's when, different. That, when that was found, that was very surprising, right? Yeah, it was. Now and that celly protein has many, many different names too. Yeah, MAPS <laughs> yeah. and IPS one, and yeah, <laughs> there was one more I can't remember. It, it was it was, the, it was discovered in a couple of different labs at the same time, and they all named it. Yeah, thing. immunologists are not good at, at coming up with a consensus name. Consensus they they, they right. take their domain and they just keep using their own own nomenclature, so it can be kind of confusing sometimes. So in an uninfected cell, we can think of rig eye in low levels, folded up, mm -hmm. and not activating, for right. instance, inter interferon signaling. Right. Right. Now, um, just a side thing, because we're, we're revising our virology textbook, and Ever since, we're, we're, this is the fourth edition now, and every edition we have this big discussion, what's the difference between intrinsic and innate immunity? Mm -hmm. And, you know, these terms are human things that we make up to help classify and study, right? Mm -hmm. like, like any names that we, you know, I, I joked, <laughs> what was I, what did I say the other day? Oh, we have all these three-letter names for transcription proteins, and I joked at our recent meeting it would be nice to know the real names of these proteins, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the ones that nature gave them. Oh, well, there because <laughs> we make up our own names, intrinsic and innate immunity. So intrinsic, and it depends who you talk to, it can vary, but our def definition is it's something that doesn't have to be induced, which is involved in pathogen defense. Hmm. Things it isn't a term that I've typically used. I usually say innate. So innate, it has to be induced, right? No, because like complement and things are already around and we consider that innate immunity. I know, that's a big problem for us, right. for our definition, <laughs> right? But, you know, interferons are innate immunity and they're induced in that kind they of They are. And so this definition is a problem, I agree, because we call uh, rig eye, MAVs, uh, MDA5 innate immunity because they lead to interferon production, but they're there at low levels. They don't, right, right, right. They are induced later, but... So this is a problem, and I. And it, and so I've always I've always called innate immunity like the loaded gun. So the things that are ready to go are there, but then there's induced innate immunity. That's how I've looked at it. So you don't bother so, with intrinsic at all. No, I've never used that term. Yeah. And I also, honestly, I mean, I I've heard of intrinsic in regards to antiviral f factors and restriction factors, proteins, but I I don't really use intrinsic in, you know, conversation or writing. I'm yeah. Well, if you look in the name. literature, there are big debates by right. famous immunologists, you know, right. who <laughs> say this is intrinsic, that. Anyway, um, I teach it intrinsic innate because the book is written that way, and I, and I use the book as a guide. And intrinsic things are like trim proteins that are there already, uh, microRNA defenses, small RNA defenses. Um, but it's a really fuzzy thing and it's kind of artificial in the end so i call what we're going to talk about today is innate immunity because interferons are induced but you're right the, the serum protein we were talking about that the other day what do we do with that and we we shake our heads we don't know what to do with it 
Okay. <laughs> All right, so now the paper. It's published in Cell, which doesn't mean anything, by the way. I know. I think, uh, just as a side note, we for shouldn't my say that anymore. Paper, no, 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 no. You can <laughs> say sell or you sell papers. I think I'm going to try to pick a non sell paper because there, yeah, there's, fine. there's obviously many good really, ones out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm in the middle of an argument with an editor of a journal and of sell. No, not sell, not at all. Um, and I'm arguing that this editorial rejection of papers is just wrong, you know, because ma- many of yeah. these big journals, um, they, will only review about 30, 20 or 30 percent of what they get with the idea that that is how they make it an exclusive, exciting journal, mm-hmm. right? Which right. is ridiculous. And then our careers depend on publishing in these big journals. And I think that publish, science publishing should be journal agnostic. It should just be the science that you look at. But unfortunately, we don't. And uh, so I'm in a big argument with a, with an editor about this. And uh, it's going so is, and the, is the response uh, just the opposite of what you're saying. No, in fact, we have to reject that many to keep it exclusive. Are they that blunt about it? Are they more walking around it? So there are two kinds of editorial rejection. Cell science and nature have employees, editors, who may or may not be science, former scientists, right, mm-hmm. who editorially reject. And that I think that's horrible because they don't know the field that well. They're not working in it. Then you can have arguments about that. But then the other kind is having journals where there are a board of science editors who are actually running labs and they do editorial rejection. And so the editor is arguing that that's better. That's okay to have scientists. And I said, I don't think in any case should someone look at your paper for five minutes and decide whether it should be reviewed or not. Right, uh, the right. Journal of Virology reviews 95% of what's submitted. And I think that should be the model. And let the reviewers decide. They look at it carefully, right? Whereas an editor is never going to look at it carefully. I heard a talk by a editor in the PLOS Journal system who said, I do not spend more than five minutes at a, on a paper deciding whether it is going to be reviewed or not. Wow. So wow. you better make it really interesting, yeah. which really bugged me to say make it interesting because that is such a quality. I mean, doesn't – yeah, that's a call to really, you hmm. know – put words that in your titles that maybe are alluding to things that you don't prove in the paper yeah yeah or in the abstract for instance no, so anyway i'm well, sorry to, side, sorry to go tangent. off but no I'm, i think people are interested in this i mean it really does dictate our lives as scientists where we publish how much we publish and of course it's a really big money business huge um, and that, it's huge and, so and we have to pay to publish which is crazy it's like you write a novel and you pay to get it published. That's uh, crazy. And then you have to pay to read it too. <laughs> you have to pay to read it. And then we, we review the papers and get nothing in For return. Free. It's crazy. It's all screwed up. <laughs> and as I get older, you know, when I was younger in science, I didn't think about this at all. And now I think about it because it's an issue. And I see how it tears up young scientists just getting into the field. Oh, I have to get my paper in that journal to get my first grant. And it should not be that way. You just should do good science, right? Right, right. Yeah, it's more of a game. So this paper is called Self-Recognition of an Inducible Host LNCRNA by Rigai Feedback Restricts Innate Immune Response. Well, that has a lot of uh, really yeah. complicated terms in it. We're going so we'll, to have We'll take them apart. Yeah. Um, it is from, well, the authors are from various institutions in China. We have um, the Peking Union Medical College. You know, it's funny. It used to be Peking, and they changed it to Beijing, which is mm. much nicer, right? But this, the college still is called Peking Union Medical <laughs> College. Yep. And from uh, the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences, uh, also in Beijing, and then from the Second Military Medical University in Shanghai, uh, the Nankai University in Chanjin, China, and the first authors. So let's see, we have some equal contributors here. The first two authors, Ming Hong Zhang and Shi Kun Zhang are both equal contributors. And then we have the last author being Xu Tao Kao. All right. So this is really cool. Involves a lot of um, molecular biology and they do things in vitro. They do things in purified systems and then they try and validate them in cells. So that's kind of nice that they that they do both things, and they use a variety of acids. I'm going to try and explain it. Um, 
as we go on. And and so they start with this idea that, all right, we told you that rig eye recognizes foreign, but are there any RNAs in cells that can bind rig eye? And what they end up looking at are called LNC RNAs, long non-coding RNAs, which are defined as RNAs bigger than 200 nucleotides, kind of an arbitrary cutoff there, but they're bigger than small interfering RNAs, and they don't code for anything. They're not translated. They don't have open reading frames, and they're typically transcribed from the regions between genes on chromosomes. And this is something, when I was a student, when I was a postdoc, we didn't even know they were there. Right. (laughs) We had no idea. But now with the ability to sequence extensively, we find them. We should have known that all of those uh, extra sequences were doing something, right? Because there's evolutionarily must be a reason why we have so much excess (laughs) non-coding genetic information. You know, when when the first genomes were sequenced, they found all this. And they called it junk. Yeah, right, junk. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> like the 2%, 2% encoded proteins, yes. 98% was junk. junk. Oh, it's right, so terrible. Right. And now we're realizing it's not junk. And in fact, there's a great blog by, um, I think, Michael Eisen, one of the co-founders of the PLOS journals. And it's called, It's Not Junk. <laughs> it's Not Junk. And so LNC RNAs are one of these non-coding RNAs. And they in this paper, they find that LN, a certain LNC RNA can bind rig eye and has interesting effects. And the method that they start off with is really interesting. It's called UV RIP, <laughs> <laughs> ultraviolet radio immunoprecipitation. So if you think about a cell, it's full of proteins and RNAs and all kinds of other things. If you want interested in protein RNA interactions, if if they're binding each other and you irradiate the cell with ultraviolet light, it will it will chemically cross-link the RNAs to the protein. So if it's if they're near each other in the cell, just shining UV light on it is going to cross-link it. So then you can say, well, can I now identify these cross-linked proteins? So what they do is they have a cell line that is producing a form of rig eye that they've engineered to have what we call a flag tag on it. All right, and flag is because it looks it's a flag, basically. It was invented an eight amino acid sequence, which you could stick onto any protein, and we have antibodies against those eight amino acids. And therefore, if you don't have an antibody to rig eye, you can then use this flag. So you can make a, a DNA construct, flag fused to rig eye, put it in cells, and then you can do UV irradiation. And then you can add, break open the cells, add antibody to the flag, pull out those, and sequence them. And that's what we can do now that we couldn't do <laughs> 20 years ago. You could take all the RNA that immunoprecipitates with this antibody to rig eye yep. and sequence it, which is so cool. And this is not hard to do anymore because there are machines and facilities that will sequence it for, for you. So they do this with and without virus infection. They use vesicular stomatitis, an RNA virus that's known to be sensed by rig eye. And they say, well, we get a bunch of RNAs that are bound to rig eye. They take the top 30 in terms of abundance, and they systematically knock each one down with small interfering RNA. That's no small task. And that's just like the first part of figure one. It's (laughs) it's amazing how much work is in here, right? That's like every figure is one good paper. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're asking if we knock any of these down, is it going to have any effect on interferon production in virus-infected cells? And so... They find one that seems to be interesting where if you, so if you infect cells with VSV and if you knock down this particular long non-coding RNA, you get more interferon produced in the, in the knockdown. So that's interesting, right? Mm-hmm. And this is, they call this LNC-LSM3B. We'll, we'll call it LSM3B from now on. And it's, it's the product of a particular locus on the chromosome. Okay. And this 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 phenotype would suggest that this is some sort of negative regulatory effect, right? Which isn't exactly right. what one might expect, you know, because if you infect with virus, you're going to get interferon, and then one would think that maybe the virus expresses something to shut that down. But this is actually the cell expressing yeah, to increase right. it. And and that's important. A lot of viruses do encode antagonists of of this whole signaling pathway at all multiple steps, and uh, yep. and as we'll see. 
this negative regulation doesn't happen right away and you would probably wouldn't want it to, right? Right. right. Yeah, exactly. You've, the timing is really important yes. for for this uh, for this experiment and in regards to the immune response in terms of the innate or intrinsic right, <laughs> right. immune response. So they, they look at the uh, induction of this long LSM3B. They use PCR and they can see that it's actually induced during VSV infection. It's induced with infection with another virus, sendivirus, which is also sensed by rig eye. Or if you transfect into cells, double-stranded RNA with 5' prime triphosphate, which, as I told you earlier, is a, a ligand for rig eye. So it goes up under all of these conditions, and they actually measure the number of molecules. Um, the, these... These experiments are now being done. I, I didn't tell you the first series of experiments. These uh, radio immuno, this RIP, UV RIP was done in a macrophage cell line, and it's a mouse. All this is done in mouse cells. Yes. The next set of experiments are done in uh, peritoneal macrophages from mice, and they, they, can quanti- they can infect those with these viruses. They quantify. Uh, so in uninfected cells, there are about 30 molecules per macrophage of this uh, LSM3B, and it goes up to 250 after infection. That's going to be important later because you may say, is that enough to do anything? Well, it turns out that it is, actually. It's really amazing. And here's another cool experiment. They can make these macrophages. What do you want to say why they're using peritoneal macrophages? Just, Cindy, you can get a bunch uh, of them. <laughs> you, you, you can get more of them. Uh, people have different preferences. You could use bone marrow derived macrophages yep. or peritoneal macrophages. They have different activation states. Okay. Uh, sometimes you have to activate the peritoneal. It depends. I didn't look that carefully at whether they used elicited macrophage or uh, resident macrophage. So the resident ones in the peritoneal cavity, you typically have to give them a little tickle before they'll yeah, do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember um, I did a rotation as a grad student. We used to inject thioglycolate. Exactly, yeah. And then wait and pull out the mac. Okay, so there's basically a bunch of dirty crap that you dirty just crap, put in there. Yeah. <laughs> it activates them. <laughs> so they make these macs from mice where the interferon type 1 receptor gene has been knocked out. And there you don't induce this LSM3B after virus infection anymore. So that tells you right away that it's induced by interferon. Which is pretty neat because if this is going to be a regulator of interferon, it makes sense to have it in, induced by interferon, right? But the induction takes a long time, it takes many hours. Um, and, and again, that makes sense because you want to have the interferon made and deal with virus infection before you shut it off, right? Right. You know, the one experiment I'm not sure that I saw in here, and you guys might uh, remember, did they add interferon? to see if that alone induces expression of this. I know they did all the infection studies and they did this in the interferon yeah, receptor yeah, yeah. deficient they mice. They do, okay. Yeah, in these peritoneal, they add interferon and they show it induces it and it takes a long time, like 12 to 16 hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they also okay. show that the promoter of the gene from which LSM3B is made is, indu- is activated by interferon. So it must have an interferon response element, right? Right, Which right, is cool. Right. Makes perfect sense. Really cool. Yep. Um, Continuing in these peritoneal macrophages, they show that uh, this protein will bind rig eye because remember it was originally pulled out by an interaction, RNA. and and RNA now they will. show that they that the RNA of LSM three B will bind rig eye, uh, and that goes up after infection, as you would guess. The RNA is found in the cytoplasm. They can actually stain for it using a, a technique called. Um, Fish fluorescent in situ hybridization, and it co-localizes with rig eye. So you could stain for the RNA and rig eye, and you can see that they co-localize. Um, and they find it's also in other immune cells, NK cells, dendritic cells, T cells, and B cells. This is all supplemental, of course. <laughs> Another thing that I could go on about, but I won't. A lot of supplemental figures, yes. And... It is a non-coding RNA. There's no open reading frame. And they even look in polysomes. So in fact, in cells you know, that are translating, you have mRNAs with ribosomes attached to them. You can purify those easily on sucrose gradients. And you can sequence the RNA that's on them. And they do that. And they say it's not on the polysome. It's really amazing because that, right. that, that in itself is, a, is an incredible amount of work. Right. 
And the localization of this particular long non-coding RNA is interesting because obviously, I mean, there are there's a splice variant of this gene that resides mostly in the nucleus. Mm -hmm. The the one that we're talking about actually makes it out to the cytoplasm because of its function to interact with a um, cytoplasmic pattern recognition receptor. Yeah, so I would yeah. be interested in knowing, you know, this paper does is not going to answer that question for me, but the regulation of that coming out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm, why does the other splice variant stay in the yeah. nucleus and this one comes out? So I thought that, I thought maybe they would deal with that later on, but I think that must be a, you know, separate a lot. For yeah, sure. Yeah. For there's, sure. There's already it a lot could here. be a sequence or it could simply be that if you eat you, know, you can go back and forth, and if you get trapped out in the cytoplasm, you accumulate. That's possible, too. Possible. Or because we know it's concentration-dependent, meaning it has to build up enough interferon to stimulate the induction, maybe it's just if there's enough of the LNC in the nucleus, it just starts escaping out to the cytoplasm. It's just a simple concentration dependent. Yeah, that could be, too. Yep. Yeah. By the way, we're saying LNC, but I've heard talks calling it LINK. 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 Yes, link. Yeah. So I. Yeah, you could you, call it link. Sure. Link, I think you can it? call it either way. I've heard it link. Sure. Well, yeah, link. Yeah, the link is good. Missing link, right? <laughs> All right. Con continuing with link three B. No, it's LSM three B. It's a it's a link LSM three yeah, B. Yeah. It's too long. LSM. We could call <laughs> it the link RNA. It's, it's, it's only one they're dealing with here. Yeah, yeah. If you knock it down in um, these peritoneal macrophages again with small interfering RNA. You get increased interferon and IL-6, which is another one. It's a cytokine downstream of Rig I after VSV and send a virus infection, but not infection with herpes simplex virus, which is nice because you shouldn't. It's a DNA virus. Mm. Right? So you shouldn't be. Don't some DNA viruses make an RNA that can activate? They do. Yes. In fact, I think uh, varicella zoster makes a PAL-3 RNA that is sensed by RNA sensors. Yeah. Mm. And I think they have done some studies on people who get serious uh, shingles and they have mutations in, in the Paul 3 or, or oh, the sensor. I can't remember. We did that on Twiv. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, to extend that, there are RNA viruses that damage the mitochondria, releases mitochondrial mm -hmm. DNA, which is then sensed by I DNA see. sensors, right? Yeah, <laughs> So yep, exactly. just because the virus is one or the other doesn't mean that's the only thing that's going to sense it. Yeah. Okay, then... Um, a bunch of more experiments to characterize this. They knock, as I said, they knock it out. They they knock out the gene in this macrophage cell line, which they can do with the cell line. Which is weird because it's not a gene, right? This is so strange. Yeah, yeah, it's not really yeah. a gene, right? It's <laughs> the coding region for it. Yeah. And then you can infect these cells. They make more interferon. Virus yield is reduced compared to wild-type cells. And then downstream of rig I binding RNA, there's... Other events, one of them is phosphorylation of a transcription factor called IRF3, and that phosphorylation is higher in the knockout cells. Again, you know, you're making more interferon. Um, so the idea here is that this RNA is suppressing rig I triggered interferon production. And all of this happens later in the infection, as we said, which makes sense. You don't want to suppress it earlier. Right. Actually, IRF3 phosphorylation should be, yes, in the knockout cells, it should be higher. That's right, because you're making more interferon, right? Sometimes it's, with these it, it's negatives. It's not that higher early. <laughs> yeah, it's not higher early. It's later. It's That's higher right. later. Okay. All right, then they move into mice. They knock out the coding sequence for this link RNA. <laughs> How's that? And they are less Incredible. susceptible to VSV-induced lethality. You can put enough VSV in mice to kill them. Uh, if you use less virus, they'll live longer, and you can study those animals, and they find that, again, knocking out the gene for this link RNA, they make more interferon in the serum, virus levels are lower, their lung inflammation is reduced, and they also do an infection with influenza virus, um, more interferon in the knockout mice, but if you infect the mice with herpes simplex, there's no, there's no interferon difference. 
And so looking at these experiments and this time course, the set of how long they do this, one would think that why do we need you know, long non-coding RNAs to stop mm. for a guy from, because these animals actually do better. But I think if they were to take it out longer, you would see then maybe the pathology induced by these high levels of interferons. Yeah. So yeah. looking j- just at that experiment, it, it almost is like, well, why do, you know, why would we need those? Those animals are actually doing better. Sure. Than, sure. Than and, right? and in certain mouse models for virus infection, you can show that there right. is, there is pathology caused by, Whatever arm of the immune response you want to pick, right? It depends on the virus, but you could say it's interferon induced or it's NK cell, B cell, T cell, whatever. Yeah. I was surprised at the time course of that particular study. I'm used to looking at you know survival curves over days, mm-hmm. you know, or to weeks. This is this is these mice are gone in 24 hours, pretty much. Yeah. Right. Yep. This is a pretty high dose of it's yeah, high. They yeah, they give a Yeah. 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 All right, so now how does this work? Because I just told I told you in the beginning that if an RNA binds Rig I, it's going to activate interferon system. So hmm, synthesis. Right. So this is an RNA binding Rig I. What's going on? Ah, that's the cool part, right? Yeah. So they do a lot of experiments where they basically they incubate pieces of Rig I with this uh, LNC RNA, and then they can immunoprecipitate those complexes with um, an antibody to Rig I, and they can see what's interacting. With what? So they show doing that, and then they move it into cells. So first, in vitro interaction studies, they can show this long non-coding RNA can bind the C-terminal domain of Rig I. All right? And and that's just the C-terminal domain on its own. And that, in theory, should result in card exposure, right? Because that's how it works. The RNA binds the C-terminus, and then the card exposure gets exposed. And... But what they find is that this long non-coding RNA competes for the binding of other RNAs to Rig I. So poly IC is a double-stranded synthetic RNA that's often used as a stimulator of Rig I because you can buy it. It's cheap. <laughs> and, yep. <laughs> and you can just add it to cells. And they show that this long non-coding RNA will actually compete with it. So it's doing something different enough so that it compete but not activate uh, interferon synthesis by binding to Rig I and double stranded RNA also binds to the card um, to the to the C terminus. So what's going on here? So they're thinking that maybe this uh, link is a is actually a competitive inhibitor. And so, but if it is, how does that work? How would you get an RNA to bind differently enough so that it would be a contem- a, a competitive inhibitor? Uh, so they do a kind of interesting experiment to confirm what I've just told you in cells that it's a competitive inhibitor. They so they they infect cells with VSV, and these are either wild type cells or cells lacking the long non coding RNA. Then they radio they immunoprecipitate RNA that binds to Rig I from those cells. They then extract the RNA and they transfect it into other cells and look for <laughs> interferon activation. So it's a little complicated, but basically, if you have just this long non coding RNA binding to Rig I, it will not a- activate interferon very well. It will. It will not activate interferon well and when you transfect it into cells because it's going to bind RNA and, and inhibit it, and that's what they actually show. If you extract the RNA that binds to Rig I in wild-type cells infected with VSV, it's good at interferon in- induction, but not from cells lacking um, the LSM3B. All right, so what's going on? Here's another technique that's pretty cool. It's called eye clip. <laughs> Little I, like an iPhone. Big C, yep. big L, big I, P. Stands for individual nucleotide resolution, cross-linking, and immunoprecipitation. It's a way to measure protein RNA interactions at single nucleotide resolution. So you, if a protein is binding an RNA, you can say exactly what bases in the RNA are being protected or binding to the protein. And it, Basically, the method you take, um, you, you cross-link proteins and RNAs with UV light. Uh, and then you can purify them. You actually immunoprecipitate, and then you purify them um, further. You treat them with an enzyme to get rid of all the protein, and then you sequence the RNA that's left. 
Okay, so you, you, you pull out the RNA protein, you get rid of the protein, and you sequence the RNA, and you can find out uh, exactly where the protein is interacting with the RNA. So they do this with link RNA and rig I, all right? And they see that it cross-links really well to link to rig I. And the, it cross-links in areas that they have used these uh, computer programs to predict the secondary structure of the long non-coding RNA. They're called RNA folding proteins. And this RNA has a really long stem loop structure that had been predicted by these programs. And that, that's what's cross-linking uh, to rig I. But what is cross-linking is really different from what's been seen before. The, these cross-link sites are, are GA-rich, and they're folded into double-stranded RNA, but they have bulges where there's no base pairing. Mm -hmm. And that's completely different from how rig I binds to viral RNAs. Yep. All right, so it's incompletely base paired double-stranded RNA with a bulge, really high affinity rig I binding. And if they change these binding sites in the long non-coding RNA by immunogenesis, they, they abolish rig I binding. There's actually a lot of work here to show this. It's really amazing. So they have a really nice structure of how the long non-coding RNA binds to rig I, and it's totally different from viral RNA. Um, and they show that the mutations that they introduce into long non-coding RNA that abolish binding would have the expected effect on um, rig I activation. So it's no longer going to bind rig I and you're going to make interferon and so forth. And if you're having a hard time kind of envisioning what this looks like, they have a picture and they describe it as kind of like um, multiple cuttings on the, on a blade. So you have these like little notches to match what would be kind of mm -hmm. the lock of rig I. And it, so that's why that long stem is kind of reminiscent of a lock and key. Yeah. Type of a, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is really interesting is that LS, this long non-coding RNA doesn't need five prime triphosphate to bind right, rig I. Right. So in another example of how it's totally different from viral RNA or poly IC or whatever. Because if you take it off, it's the same. Yeah, right? it's the same. Right, right. So basically the, the end result is that the way this long non-coding RNA binds to rig I is totally different. And it would have to be, right, to be a competitive inhibitor. So mm -hmm. especially if you're not going to make a lot of it, because you can imagine, well, if I make a ton of this long non-coding RNA in cells, then maybe just by mass action, you would replace all the viral RNA on rig I. But there are only 250 molecules <laughs> per cell, so right. it's got to be better. So it's really binding with much higher affinity, and that's why it can bump off um, any viral RNA that's on rig I. Now, another cool thing is that when viral RNA binds rig I, it multimerizes the protein forms tetramers, and it's thought that that's important for signaling, all right? And in fact, if you, if you take out the long non-coding RNA from macrophages, you get more oligomers after viral infection. And what they're thinking, and they, they show some evidence for this, that the long non-coding RNA binds monomers and they don't form oligomers doesn't allow them to multimerize. And that's part of how it's inhibiting interferon signaling. Right. And here's where they get into numbers which are really important. So they say after 12 to 16 hours of VSV infection, you get between 1,000 and 1,700 rig I monomers per cell. This long non-coding RNA has nine binding motifs that could bind rig I. And there are between 150 to 250 copies of this RNA per cell at 12 to 16 hours after rig I infect, uh, VSV infection. So if you multiply 9 times 150 or 250, you get more than the number of rig I monomers. And they say because it's also higher affinity binding, it could easily prevent signaling by binding up all the rig I monomers, even if there's only 250 copies of this long non-coding RNA. Okay, is that how does for? the cell know though that it's already eliminated the virus and it's okay? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Completely, <laughs> there must be a way, right? I don't know. Maybe I don't know. That's a great question because it that can't just be at twelve hours in every virus infection that this goes on, right? Right, it, right. You shut it down too early. You're yeah, yeah it's a problem. problem. Yeah, sure. I, told, I don't know. Maybe that's their next grant. Maybe, <laughs> but uh, still. Um, we're left with a conundrum. This this RNA, okay, it binds rig I really well, but why doesn't it make interferon, right? 
What else? There must be something else mm-hmm. going on. And uh, w- what it is is that um, when when the RNA binds to big I, basically the card domain is still hidden. Binding of this long non-coding RNA to rig eye does not expose the card domain. And they show that by studying isolated card domain uh, with the HeLa case and with the long non-coding RNA. So somehow it is able to bind the RNA, but not make it under, sorry, the long non-coding RNA is able to bind rig eye, but it doesn't cause this conformational change, which is pretty cool. And they do, do a few experiments in cells to show that that's the case. So basically rig eye, remember, is, in an auto-repressed conformation with the card domain hidden. If viral RNA binds it, the card domain is exposed. You can have interferon synthesis. But if L, if this long, long non-coding RNA binds rig eye, card domain remains hidden. That is so cool. Isn't that cool? That's really yeah. neat, yeah. So you can imagine that early on when rig eye evolved, it led to too much interferon production. And the cells that survived happened to have this long non-coding RNA, which just happened to be able to bind it, and it got better and better with evolution, right? That's right. how it must have arisen. Mm-hmm. It's so cool. All I right, like so, this mechanism. And one more thing is that uh, something we haven't talked about is that part of the activation of rig eye involves the addition of ubiquitin mm-hmm. um, molecules, short molecules that are added to proteins that can be involved in their degradation, but in the case of rig eye, it activates its function. And LS, this LNC RNA also inhibits with ubiquitination. So that is another way that it's inhibiting the activation of rig eye. So, so, so this is a negative regulator of rig eye signaling. And if, you know, we talk about maintaining immune homeostasis, which means not too much, not too little immune response. And that's what right. this is involved in. But it's really cool that it's a self RNA that's doing it, right? Yep. A self RNA, it's not something else that is doing it. Now, the thing is that humans don't have LSM. I know, I know, right? <laughs> and it's well, the very like well, little last part last of that part. last paragraph. The last part, yeah. there's no gene in humans that makes this long non-coding RNA. Because and, maybe you could, you know, go to autoimmune patients and see if they have if that LM3 gene. If they if they don't produce, but if they don't have this, if it's no homology. That's tough. I, I mean, you got to go do this whole study do the whole again. Thing. <laughs> but you know, I'm sure they tried it, right? Because if they got the mouse it's result, they, I'm sure they said, let's try it in human cells. So you would do the UV rip with human cells. Right. Maybe that's why it took a year to get it published. Maybe. And maybe it, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Point. Well, there's no 3B. So maybe it's something else because there's certainly other long non-coding yeah. RNAs in yeah, human sure. cells. But maybe it wasn't clear or maybe there's another one that they're working on. They're going to have another paper. Who knows? But that's kind of curious, right? Couldn't you take structural analysis and find out one whether human um, rig eye bound to this mouse link RNA, and, and also this uh, if they solve the structure of the interaction between the link RNA and the rig eye, then maybe they could intuit what mm. the the sequence might be in human and search for that. That would be easy to look for the sequence, right? So yeah, doing the human rig eye would be good. And if it bound, then you could say, well, the mouse sequence is able to do it. Is there something similar in the human genome? Yeah. So right now we could do this experiment because we have the sequence of this LNC3B. We could just blast it against the human transcriptome. But the sequence yeah. that they found, though, uh, the binding sequence, though, is too small, right? You can't you can't look for AGA. Mm. No, you'd have to look for the whole thing and then yeah. maybe you don't have it. But I, I would do that first before doing the UV rip on human cells, because that's quite a bit of work Yeah, right. to, to, to do the immunoprecipitation and the sequencing of the RNA. It would take a while, and it's expensive. So yeah, there must be something in humans that does a similar thing, right? Definitely. One would I mean, think. One I would, would think. think so. And it's a really, I mean, the paper really describes it well, and every with every step, it's kind of like, oh, okay, that makes sense. You have interferons that are induced. They're going to induce this long non-coding RNA, and then eventually it reaches a concentration, it helps shuts it down. I, yeah, I think that we there's probably a similar mechanism. And by looking at patients that have defects in the ability to shut down um, or, or to recognize cytoxolic uh, double-stranded RNAs could be where you would look. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
But, um, but can't you sequence the long non-coding RNAs like you can sequence microRNAs? Couldn't you just look for interferon-induced links you could. and then see if any of those fit the criteria yeah, for binding? And those data? those are published. You could easily you could just take the data, you could just for, mine it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is it emphasizes how different mice and humans can be, right? Always, mm. <laughs> you always come across these differences, and f when you write a grant, they ding you often, right? Mm -hmm. you know, we, we don't want you to do this in mice. Well, it's kind of, you know, powerful <laughs> to be. It is. I mean, we, what we learned through this paper is it's a lot and it's important. <clears throat> and, and, you know, I've been looking at the literature for all, a lot of these sensors and you, you knock them out in mice and you get a phenotype with respect to virus infection. And then you find humans with mutations in the genes and it's totally different. Mm, it's right. It's so weird, right? Mm. It's just. So, so TLR three in mice is a is a major sensor of polio virus, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Not in humans. Mm -hmm. We don't know what is, but there are humans with TLR three mutations, and they don't get more polio. They get more herpes, but not I was going to say they get herpes and stuff. So right? weird, yeah. It's just so you have to be really careful with, as we say on Twiv, mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I hope you understood that. It's tough, but... But didn't we do a paper that said mice don't lie? <laughs> yeah. <sure. laughs> I think in the end, you have to be careful of being dogmatic, right? Right. <laughs> like sometimes. <laughs> you have to be flexible. Good. Let's read some emails. Sure, sure. Steph, can you take that, that first one? Yeah, yeah. Let me get down to it. Okay, so this is from Unknown. Is that is that the first one there? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Unknown writes, fascinating feature article focus on, focuses on immunology, dot, 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 from the New York Times, what the mystery of the tick-borne meat allergy could reveal, unraveling why tick bites are suddenly causing a strange reaction in some people who eat meats could help scientists better understand how allergies work. And I have looked, I guess I'm out of my quota for New York Times articles. It's not <laughs> letting me see that and I'm not paying for, well, whatever they want. So what I remember, and I'm, I've kind of looked up, there's a certain type of tick in the southeast of the United States and it is this, what is it called? The, the um, Lone, Lone Star. Lone, Lone Star. Star tick, it has yes. a very, um, it has a dot, characteristic dot, yellow spot on its back. And when I, it's, it's caused by an allergy to a sugar that's found in red meats. Um, galactose, alpha one, three galactose or alpha gal. And that's right. Alpha gal. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so essentially if a tick bites you and you're going to develop al um, my, my apologies, antibodies against this sugar. And so then when you eat meat, you're going to come in contact with that sugar. Yeah. And then those antibodies are going to react with that protein and potentially causing an allergy. And these people that were having this allergy, mm -hmm. it's very rare, but they were having trouble breathing in the middle of the night a certain amount of time after they ate the meats. And you know, you're not going to think that it's a meat allergy. You know, if you can't breathe, maybe whatever anaphylaxis or why that could be true, but it, it happened to be, they're associating, there needs to be more mm -hmm. evidence yeah. to prove this link. But the, the association is that it's this antibody against the uh, sugar in red meat. Yeah, the, so they, the, the article does a great job walking through this. So it yeah. says, when the lone star tick feeds, alpha-gal leaks from its mouth into the wound, so you get an exposure, but exposure to alpha gal alone probably doesn't is not enough. They've identified an enzyme in tick saliva called dipeptidyl peptidase that works mm -hmm. as an adjuvant. Mm. It's also common in bee and wasp venom, and uh, they, they think this enzyme gives you this the itching and swelling. So they actually start off with a story of a man who ate a hamburger and had this incredible reaction had to go to the emergency room and he lived in chapel hill north carolina huh. <laughs> look <laughs> so, at that <laughs> yeah it's pretty cool so it's an interesting story yeah very good and it's nicely described there definitely uh kevin writes immune team for a future podcast it would be great to hear a brief explanation of the velocimmune mouse system not happy to use a proprietary term for basic scientific discoveries the 2013 PNAS paper by Lynn McDonald quickly gets to technical. Thanks. And I couldn't find this 2013 paper. Uh, I did find 2014. I did find a 2014 paper, um, precise and in situ humanization of six megabases of mouse immunoglobulin genes, which has McDonald as the first author. I think that was the one. Mm -hmm. 
mm. that he made. This comes from Regeneron, mm. humanizing a part of a, of a mouse, which is something Regeneron would do. They're into mice. Yeah. Yeah, we could explain. If well, this is the right yeah. paper. So Maybe Kevin, Kevin can let us know. Yeah, yeah, Let us know if this is the right paper and we can explain it. Absolutely. Or, or um, you know, Steph or, or uh, yeah, yeah. Cindy can because. We could even, I mean, if we're not, we don't need to necessarily do a whole episode because we have a yeah, couple yeah, sure. interesting things, we're, but maybe a snippet next time. For sure. Cindy, can you take the next one? I can. It says, Dear Cynthia, in Immune 11, you say it is important to complete the full course of antibiotics to prevent resistance. Could you elaborate on that? The way I understand it, by stopping taking antibiotics, you remove the selective pressure to develop resistance, and so you lower its chances. And if the resistance has already developed, by continuing taking antibiotics, you actually help it to persist by removing the non-resistant competitors. For what it's worth, Brit British immunologists seem to agree with me. We don't always have to believe British immunologists. <laughs> I quote, I have always thought it to be illogical to say that stopping antibiotic treatment early promotes the emergence of drug resistant organisms. Unquote, says Peter Oppenshaw, president of the British Society for Immunology. Now, I I was I was ready to give a response to this, but Vincent, you you actually went and spoke to Michael Schmidt about this and he had some really great things to say. Is that right? Yeah, you can you can uh, read his response. Okay, sure. so so he says Michael says two words persister cells. So it says, recall that there is always a fraction of the population responsible for an infection that are dormant and highly refractory to antibiotic exposure. So as the antibiotic trowel falls in the patient, so their concentration of act, uh, you know. Um, therapeutic levels of antibiotics fall in the patient, the persisters awaken, and then they are killed by the next dose. The whole course of antibiotic drops the concentration population of the infecting microbe to a sufficiently low level to enable the immune system to clear the infection. Absent the whole course of antibiotics, the persisters may or may not win out. Second, a subclinical course of antibiotics can select out a resistant population. That's more of the definition that I had heard. The subclinical course results from not taking the meds on time or a physiologic condition like drinking beer or coffee when taking penicillin for gonorrhea will cause you to urinate with greater frequency, diluting the drug from the bladder too quickly. Thus, resistant population can expand and then escape in the patient and then get out of the patient, the patient can transmit it. Dosing was based initially on crude understanding of how the innate and adaptive arms of the immune system clear an infection. Sam, uh, same principles apply for antifungals and antivirals. Michael. So this is, this is true. So I think what the first idea is that there's always um, really slowly replicating or dormant versions of the bacterium. And so as, as you take your dose and then the concentration goes down, they can start to come back. And then when you take your next dose, it'll kill them. So that's one way. But the other way is if people um, want to spread their antibiotics out or take half a pill or stop early so that they can give it to their friends or take it another time when they get sick. The problem is the therapeutic dose drops too soon. And then uh, the, the resistant bacteria, they can start to develop resistance and then just expand up. Yep. So take your entire course. And I don't yeah. know what this president of the British Immuno Immunological <laughs> Society is thinking, but he's wrong. <laughs> and yeah, so, I know. So the Roman, take the whole course. Cindy was right. <laughs> 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 Steph, can you take the next one, please? Yeah, sure. Niraj writes, hi, immune nerds. Immune nerds. I like that. It was great listening to the latest episode on the differences between uh, cord and peripheral blood profiling of preterm and at-term babies. A particular interest was the convergence of developmental profiles for dendritic cells, natural killer cells, etc., but the marked differences within the T-cell population. And in light of this, I was very much intrigued by Steph's idea of investigating differences post-vaccination with known antigens and monitoring uh, the elicited responses. Furthermore, given the convergence, I was wondering if we could observe differences if the babies were partitioned based on ethnicity and cultural background, for sure, and and if you look at clinical trials, the majority of, pay, of populations are whites and or 
uh, I, I, socioeconomically not diverse. So yes, I do think we can find differences. Maybe there are meaningful differences in those subpopulations, but nonetheless, I always find systems biology approaches a bit too dense at times just due to the sheer amount of data they encompass. I think biologists are a little hardwired due to technical and cognitive limitations at times. <laughs> Interesting to dumb down things from a reductionist point of view. Personally, I believe it certainly helps understand things in finer detail. But overall, I think the immune team does a terrific job of analyzing, interpreting, and informing the broader non-immunology non-immunology community about the latest and most exciting developments. It's always refreshing to listen to your podcast as it always yields new information from which I certainly learn a lot. So thank you for your efforts and I wish you the very best and hope to be benefited from this for a very long time. It's very sweet. Thank you. And then Niraj writes a little bit about... um, uh, I had mentioned when you start feeling jaded as a graduate student. And really, I didn't mean, mean to uh, come off negative previously. <laughs> it can be very determined on the success uh, of your experiment. Science can make you feel bipolar one day your experiment works and it's just amazing. And the next day it doesn't and it's terrible. So um, it also, I think, depends on your mentor and, and kind of your circumstance. But uh Niraj says, um, wish you the very best with your defense. It's very nice. Um, and yeah, face the committee one last time. That's very sweet. And Niraj is a scientist at Sutrafax. You can be bipolar even if you're not doing experiments uh, in I was going to say, right. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, yes, yes. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Which is, but you make it right. You make it what you can and you find the joy in it. And that's why we do it because we love it. And what else yeah, can we yeah. be doing? But science. And, you know, I want to comment on one thing that she said, and it's, it's this this idea of dumbing things down. I, I, I don't like that terminology, and I'm not criticizing her at all. Him. But I think we need to, to change that terminology because I don't think any of it is dumbing down. It's taking out excess information for the audience that you're trying to reach. You know, um, sure. it, the, 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 the less scientifically advanced you you the audience is the more of the detail you have to take out. And it's not, I don't think it's dumbing it down. It's not necessarily changing the message. It's changing the, um, the, the volume of information so that the person can understand. And I think that I always have this idea that the, sometimes the less you say, the more someone remembers. Mm -hmm. And so overloading with the details, they won't remember the big picture. Whereas if you just give them the big picture, they'll walk away with that and they'll have learned something. Definitely. I agree. Niraj is a guy, by the way. Oh. He's been writing Has to written Twivel. to us before, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. He writes to Twiv a lot also. Yeah. And I think he wrote once that I'm, I'm a guy. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. We have two more. Let's do them. Adam writes, hi, I'm a medical intern from Sweden with an interest in infectious diseases. Within that sphere, I find sepsis particularly fascinating. I have mostly read about the clinical and, to a lesser degree, the microbiological aspects of it. So, therefore, I would find it really interesting to hear you talk about the immunological aspects of it. The immunological response is, in a way, what makes the difference between sepsis and ordinary infection. Best regards, Adam is from Halmstad, Sweden. You could talk about sepsis, right? Yeah, Yeah. great suggestion. And I was just thinking and postulating about, you know, there are gut bacteria that you can find in the bloodstream after, you know, in, in a patient that has sepsis. And so it's interesting to think about how our gut protects us from the commensals that mm-hmm. are there. Mm-hmm. And we, yeah, so there'd be a lot we could talk about. Okay. And the last one, Cindy. Sure. Rachel writes, hello, immune friends from Calgary. Calgary, Canada. I think she she didn't mean we're from Calgary, Canada. She's from <laughs> Calgary, Canada. Uh, first of all, I absolutely love the Immune Podcast. I started listening this summer, and now I'm finally caught up and cannot wait for your next episode. I'm also cheering on Stephanie as she approaches her defense. Best of luck in the final stretch. Oh, okay. I am an immunology PhD student at the University of Calgary studying the innate immune response to Staphylococcus aureus. So, of course, I loved the episode on immunomimetic designer cells. I'm wondering if you could spend an episode or at least comment in your podcast about neutrophils. I was a bit surprised that neutrophils weren't brought up when talking about the innate response to S. aureus, since those cells are one of the first cells to be recruited, and they're so important to kill bacteria. 
But what I think is more interesting and somewhat unexpected is the emerging area of neutrophil biology and angiogenesis, wound repair, chronic infections, and cancer. She said there's a new science paper just came out on neutrophil nets in tumor awakening in the lung. Neutrophils, as my supervisor likes to say, are enigmatic immune cell. In a recent perspective article, and she provides a link, uh, he comments although about although there are 100,000 papers about neutrophils, we still don't quite understand what they do, and there are so many questions about their roles in different diseases that need to be answered. Part of my research is to figure out what these neutrophils are doing during an SRAS biofilm infection in skin, and I use intravital microscopy to help me answer these questions. It would be great for us to hear your thoughts about neutrophils, and in particular, what we don't know. All the best, Rachel Kratophil. I hope I said that right. So... Uh, it sounds like if you're working on neutrophils, you probably know more about them than we do. <laughs> <laughs> but I can say that you know, I just got back from a conference um, with the Society for Leukocyte Biology, and there were a large number of people who are working on neutrophils. And I thought one of the most interesting aspects of this, and you sort of bring this up with you know their potential in angiogenesis, wound repair, chronic infection, cancer. We always have thought of neutrophils as, and I teach them as the kamikaze pilots. They come in, they eat bacteria. Bacteria, they die, they get cleared. And it, it seems to me there is a lot more nuance to them. They're identifying subpopulations of neutrophils that have very different functions, um, just like macrophages have subtypes. And so I'll, I'll say that if since we didn't mention them in that in that particular episode, we were remiss because we do know that mac. Uh, that neutrophils are really important for SRAS infection. And so we were thinking, and we were, we were chatting about this before we started recording, that we should probably do a paper um, talking about specifically neutrophils and maybe their nets. And maybe so this suggestion for this paper might be a really good idea. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I think um, since we have other plans, Cindy, for years for November, maybe I'll do that in December. That sounds great. You, you'll have been defended by then. I will, yes, yes. So what are you going to do? Are you going to go back and wrap things up in the lab? Yeah, we have some new people. So we have a new grant that's going to continue the research that I'm doing now, which is great. We have new people coming in. So I'm going to be training them and organizing and trying to, you know how it goes. If you finish, there's a lot of boxes that need to organize. So <laughs> I'll be doing a lot of organizing. Yes. Good for you. Because when people leave my lab, they don't seem to do it. Oh my gosh, no, then, I got then, then I have to call them and say, where's this? And they're like, that was 10 years ago. I don't remember. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh. How can people not remember your thesis work? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. There, actually, it, some people do organize, others do not, but that's fine. All right, let's do some picks of the week. Or the month? Yes. I think I said the month, right? Steph, what do you have yeah, for us? The month. Yeah. So uh, Carolyn Coyne, she's a professor at the Children's Pediatric Hospital or Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. And she, ha I just saw today, there's a new podcast that she's co-hosting that highlights um, research that they're doing at their institution. But I'm really interested in pediatric related research. So I'm going to be starting that podcast. I thought I'd share and, and I'll, I'll link that in the show notes. So it's called um, That's Pediatrics and um, got that link right there. So that's my pick of the week. Cool. Great. Got three episodes here. Nice. All right. Uh, Cindy, what do you have for us? So I have Trilobite Glassworks. So when I when we recorded live at American Society for Virology, they the society had invited a bunch of artists. You guys probably know this because you were there, um, and th that were you know, showing various different things. And it was mostly viruses, you know, because it was a virology meeting, but there was a few immune cells here and there. And uh, so there was, so there was a neutrophil and I got a neutrophil, uh, a glass necklace. Um, and, and I, I talked to the woman and I said, oh, but you don't have a macrophage. She's like, no, do you want me to make one? So she has made me one. <laughs> oh, uh, so, I, so, so, cool. I now, so I got it in the mail the other day. I haven't worn it yet, but I did wear my neutrophil to the Society for Leukocyte Biology meeting that I went to. And I got so many comments about it. And so I think maybe the listeners would be interested in that too. And we'll put a link to um, her it's uh, Jane Hartman, her webpage. And then um, if you look, there are some pictures. Uh, we'll 
the link up for the pictures maybe of the glasswork. And if you go there, you can see the macrophages she made me. <laughs> yeah, cool. I'm looking at the Etsy site. Did you review it? Because I think I see. I did. Uh, yeah, it looks There's a whole great. bunch of them. I, it was an iterative process. So so she said, here, you know, here are some ones I made, which one we, we looked at images first and I, we, we agreed on a couple of images and then she made different versions of it and she had oh, some with pseudopodia cool. and things and I was like, eh, you know, it doesn't work that way. And so uh, we narrowed it down. She made two or three different sets and then we finally got to the final version. So it was fun. Cool. It's really cool. And I saw that you put in there also that you've um, talked about artwork in your blog. Is that right? Yeah, I, have, I keep a list of microbe artists, and she's one of them, of course. Yeah. Uh, and I bought her stuff a while ago. I've seen her at a number of conferences, ASV, also ASM she's been at. And her stuff is very cool. Yeah. I like it very much. Um, so, that, yeah, it's great. It's great to have her at, and, and a couple of others at ASV. That was really cool. Yeah. All right, my pick is a organization, a nonprofit called Research America. And whenever I give a talk at the end, I mention them and I ask the audience who's heard of it. And usually the audience is scientists and um, two or three people out of a hundred will have heard of Research America, which is a, which is an organization that increases awareness of, of health and uh, economic benefits of medical research. So they, um, do a number of things that are really cool. One thing is they lobby the Hill to to increase the funding for science. So often when the NIH budget goes up, it's because Research America has lobbied them, and that's really important. They have a lot of information on their site. Their president, who I have met and whose name is sadly escaping me at the moment, um, it gives talks, and you can have her come to your meeting. But what they do is just really cool. They do polls. They do public opinion polls. And I often use, use these in, in my talks, you know, about how the, the public perceives science and so forth. And they're really well done. And they do things like, you know, have you ever heard, what's your, who, can you name a scientist, right? And, um Oh, hardly any, <laughs> hardly any real scientists get named, oh, oh. you know, like Bill Nye gets named or something like that. Or <clears throat> Yeah, no, I just opened this up. It says 84% of Americans cannot name a living scientist. Yeah. Oh, yes. And of those that can, can wait, wait, not living. That 16% that said they could, the number one name they chose is Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking. Oh. Yeah. And who's number two, does it say? Uh, huh. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we need some uh, life scientist uh, famous people out there. But, uh, you know, they do a lot of polls like that, and, and you can use them in your talks. They're available to you. So it's a really good organization, and it's so few scientists know about it, it's sad. So I'm going to pick it today, and I'm going to pick it on TWIV tomorrow to get more awareness of it. They could really uh, – they, they do great things for us and for science in general. Was Mary Woolley the name? Mary Woolley, thank you. Mary Woolley, okay, sure. Did you find it on the site? Yeah, yeah. They have a leadership. So here's yeah. typical me. I met her at an ASM meeting years ago at some reception, and I told her about the podcast, and she said, well, I can help you. And she gave me her card, and of course, I never got in touch with her. Oh, you should. She seems interested. I don't know how she could help, but. Well, she could come on. I mean, it'd be, actually, that would be a good I do I Actually, I do want to have her on, yeah. And, yeah. um. I don't know, maybe she could spread the word on her website. Here's some good science podcasts, right? Yeah, that, that would, would be, be great. nice. Oh, yeah. And speaking of, <laughs> I, I don't know if you um, <laughs> have interacted. Let me open my, okay. Uh, I don't, her first name, Pale Yokota. If you've interacted with her, she's an immunologist, focuses on gamma delta T cells, and she's a postdoc at, um, she's in New York, uh, the Langone Health, NYU. Mm, Langone. NYU, yeah. Yeah, okay. So she um, inboxed me and said that she's been asked to be a contributor for the European Association of Cancer Research, and they're looking, they're, she's writing an article about the most influential science podcast, and so she said she'll include us in that list. Yay! To come out oh, that's in great. So good. that's great. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, we need all the help we can get. Yeah. <laughs> I was poking around on that site too while you were you were talking about that. And there's on this uh, um, Research America site, there's a button that says contact Congress. And when I went to that, it knows who your people are. And you can send a video or send a message to yeah, your, your Congress. That's, that kind of thing is great. 
That's it. Just saves so much time, and you can just. Yeah. So Mary Woolley is one thing she said. If and I always show this at my talks. If someone asks you what you do, tell them I work for you. Yeah, I love that. That's where it came from, Mary Woolley. Because yeah. if you're a scientist right. and someone says, "What do you do?" You tell them I work for you because they'll definitely say, "Wow, tell me about it," and you can c- continue to talk to them. Whereas if you say, "I work on." neutrophil nets they'll be like okay i'll see you later okay bye <laughs> <laughs> but if they if you work for them they're going to talk to you so that was brilliant i love that that's immune number 13 you can find it at apple podcast you it's on uh stitcher it's on uh, spotify it's on google play and you probably listen on your phone or tablet you have an app that you love what what apps do you guys use, by the way, to listen to podcasts? Well, you don't listen just, to podcasts, right? Just the you no, know, I do. <laughs> just the, the Apple Podcast. Apple or, Podcast. Okay. No, I I listen to podcasts all. I mean, all the time, particularly when I'm in the lab, not writing. But I honestly just open my browser and I just okay, type. That in works the too. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, if I use a program called Overcast, mm-hmm. which allows you to favorite podcasts, and I if you do listen on a app that allows you to favorite it please do and that helps us to get more visible and please subscribe to all our podcasts or your favorite subscribing really helps us because we see that number and we can tell people look at how many people are listening to us well i talked it up when i was at the meeting so that was a lot of immunologists great and we love getting your questions and comments immune at microbe.tv if you love us consider supporting us financially microbe.tv slash contribute you could buy stuff or you could buy your stuff at amazon and use our affiliate link or you know we get a percent of that doesn't cost you any more. or you can contribute you can give as little as a dollar a month microbe.tv slash contribute immune is cindy lifer from cornell university she's on twitter as cindy lifer thanks cindy um, thank you and Steph Langle, who is currently at Ohio State University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thank you, Steph. Yeah, thanks. This is great. I am Vincent Rackinello. You can find me at virology.ws or on Twitter as PROFVRR. Same, same on Instagram. Same on YouTube. I try and use the same handle everywhere. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. SteveNealPercussion.com. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month.